Hello. Welcome to the session on finding opportunities in a slower market. So uh, the blurb for this particular session uh, talks about how things don't generally remain the same forever in business. Well, this we all knew. Of course, with the recent changes being unexpected, many small businesses actually had a lot of trouble, but others found opportunities for business growth in places they never would have looked before. We're going to have a look at a few businesses, how they, what they did worked, and whether they look like surviving into the future. So let me introduce myself. My name's Christine Smith. I'm um, someone who has a good deal of experience in business, in strategy, and in working out how to move your business forward. So my speciality is helping you position yourself to drive your business forward. It's about clarifying your direction, about setting priorities, and choosing your rough approach. Most of all though, it's about taking action. So if you've got a small business or you're someone managing a business, the classic business goal is to forge ahead, to take an innovative approach, to guide the business through 2020 and beyond. We're starting to sound a bit like a cartoon character here, but actually it's really all about the next thing, which is to succeed. So classic business planning and strategy and practice is to think business continuity. So before COVID came along, we all knew it was important to plan in good times. We knew we needed a business plan. We, needed, we knew we needed a vision, a mission, a value statement. We had to do SWOT analyses. We have to do a financial plan, a marketing plan, a stock management process, a customer list, a staff. We have to have them and manage them. All those things are part of good business management. We also knew that we had to plan for the unexpected, the bad times that might, uh, please note that, might come along. We all know about risk management. However, I'm not so sure that all that many of us really believed like that something like COVID would come along, much, let his, much less hit Australia. You know, that's the stuff that happens in other parts of the world, not in good old Oz. Well, some of us have lived, lived through natural disasters. For me, I lived through Ash Wednesday in 1983 in South Australia. We, my husband and I were two years married. Um, he lost his job because the factory he was working at up in the hills got burnt literally to the ground. In fact, I still remember looking at the chassis of a caravan. I mean that literally, the metal chassis of the caravan. There were no windows, there were no walls, there was nothing. Actually, there were not even any tyres. For some of us too, up here in Darwin, where I'm from at the moment, there's things like cyclones. If you're further south, you might be thinking, or east or west, you might be thinking floods and bushfires. They're things that quite a few of us understand and experience. However, not too many of us have ever before really understood the possibility of something disastrous that spreads across everywhere in Australia, let alone everywhere in the world. So business continuity planning, is that our, our solution? Really? So before we get too far going, let's just explain what we're doing. Today is a webinar. So if you've been involved in Zoom meetings before, you'll find this is a little bit different. Um, usually what I do is I do interactive meetings. Everybody can talk you're on mute in this particular session. And we don't usually record because unless it's an official meeting, why do we need to? Well, this one will be recorded. And if you would like to see it at a later date, um, you will have access to it. Now, just in case you're only familiar with Zoom meetings, let's have a look at the menu bar on your Zoom webinar. It's a little bit different. Um, if you put your cursor onto the screen and um, wriggle it a little bit, you should end up with a menu bar 
And on that menu bar, you will see something that is called chat. And then there's another thing you'll see called Q&A. And today we have with us um, a producer, Jack Cameron, and Jack is going to be watching the Q&A and the chat. And while we're not going to be really talking much um, with you talking for, during the session, there will be a Q&A at the end. If he finds a question in that you'd like to post in between that I can answer along the way, he'll let me know. Now there's one other function on your menu bar that I'd like you to use, and that is the function called raise your hand. So right this minute, I'm wondering if you could have a look at your controls and find the raise your hand. Now with a bit of luck, Jack's going to be in a position to be watching who watches their, uh, raises their hand in a moment. So I'm going to ask you a question and I'm going to ask you to participate by raising your hand if the answer to this question for you is yes. So my question is a really easy one. Did you have to change your business or the way you do business as a result of COVID-19? So my question is, can you please raise your hand if you had to change your business or the way you do business as a result of COVID-19? And Jack's going to have a quick look and tell us sort of what the proportion of people who answered is, yay or nay. There is currently two hands up right now. Great. So we've got a small proportion of the people said yes. Hmm. And I wonder, another question for you. Do you think, thinking forward, that you're going to have to change your business again before we're really post-COVID? So could you please, um, Jack's probably put everybody's hands down and you're in a position to raise it again. Do you think you'll need to change your business again as things change into the future? I can see some hands going up. I really think most of us are going to say, yep, we're going to have to change something again. So we go back to the title of our webinar today, which is Finding More Business in a Slow Market. We're going to have to think again. So thank you for participating and thank you, Jack, for managing the hands. Did we get lots of people, by the way, who said yes? We got at least uh, one third of them uh, answering yes to that. Excellent. So we're all thinking forward, which is what we need to do. So just quickly, what is business continuity? Business continuity is, well, it's about those horrible things that might come up that you're thinking forward to. So it's about risk management or disaster planning or emergency management. Um, the real things about business continuity planning is that you need to plan for the unexpected, as well as doing your normal business plan for the expected and what you'd like to achieve, you need to keep an eye on it and then you need to adapt. So is, it, is planning enough? I've got a story for you to try to answer that question. So we're gonna to go to a movie we all remember, I hope, unless you're a lot younger than me, then what you'll be looking at is remembering a movie called Top Gun. Now, Top Gun, oh, I never realised it had anything serious. It just had a short guy pretending to be a tall guy flying planes. But actually, it has a basis on something rather strategic. In 1968, at the height of the Vietnam War, the US Navy fighter pilots started losing ground. So instead of succeeding like they really wanted to up in the, um, the dogfights up in the air, they were starting to lose ground and not doing so well. So the US military being the forward planners that they are, decided that what they would do is try something different. And in fact, what they did was they established a thing called the Top Gun School. Now, the Top Gun at school was about taking the very best Navy pilots and teaching them to fly and fight like the enemy fight pilots. Then they did something radical. They got them to work out how to um, counteract the fighter pilot stress pilots strategy, then made them the instructors for all the new Navy pilots coming in. 
The result of that was that they were much more successful in their goals. And in fact, the improvement in their results was out of, out of sight, out of mind, good from their point of view. Now, the thing about that is it wasn't just about that. It was actually about what they were doing. What they were doing was applying a new thing called adaptive thinking. It uh, uh, comes from the principles of something else called deliberate practice. And basically what it's about is this. You need to plan, already done that bit, and you need to recognise unusual situations. You need to consider what to do it and then decide what to do and do it and do it mighty fast. And that's exactly what we as business owners or senior people in small businesses, managers, team leaders, people trying to maintain a business orientation need to do. We need to plan, sure, but we actually need to be forward thinking, recognising, practising what we think is a possibility from our risk assessments and SWOT analyses, and then considering what to do and deciding and doing it. So an adaptive business is one that pivots. Um, maybe you've heard this term, pivot. It's a relatively new one. I must admit I hadn't heard it till before, pre, um, before COVID hit us all. But pivot means to shift turn, take a new consideration into uh, what you do. Now, what I put together here is an assertion a la Christine Smith, and that is that an adaptive business pivots based on our basic five questions that we're all probably familiar with. Who, what, where, when, and wait for it, why? And in fact, why? is one that's very important to business. And I'm gonna start there in a moment, talking about what adaptive businesses do or businesses trying to look for additional sales in a slow market, which that's why we're here. So why that we have to keep in mind? You need to keep in mind the things which are important to you in your business. So don't just choose any old thing to do, but rather think the customer value you want to deliver. Is there a customer demand that you could meet? Uh, are you delivering something that they consider to be value? Is there a value proposition for the customers you're going to target, your old ones or the new ones, depending on your pivot? The next is you need to keep your staff. Well, at least you have to have staff to deliver unless you're gonna drop back to doing it just yourself, which may be your strategy for the first little bit. But really what we're also trying to do is to future proof your business. Staff may be very important to that. You might be wanting to look after them. You also might be wanting to carry forward your business and future proof uh, your business for the new normal. You also might be thinking about the why of supporting the business community. So being part of a, so, a, a local supply chain or um, making sure that another business survives and can supply you so that you can do your business. You might be operating in a way that complements other people so that they can keep going. And you might be collaborating with other businesses. In fact, later on, we're going to show an example from Alice Springs of a company doing exactly that, starting a collaboration in order to pivot to their business. And last but not least, you might be thinking about how you contribute to the community. So some businesses have kept going or at least kept their doors and their capacity and their um, status in the community going by really concentrating on contributing, delivering even for free to people who are vulnerable, for instance. You may probably have heard of a gentleman by the name of uh, Simon Sinek, who's very much about this. He says the why is the most vital part. Most of us can think what, and we can certainly think how, but the, the central part of his target here is the why. The why is then part of your marketing story? What keeps you in connection with your customers? So, pivoting on the who, what, where, when, and why. Let's just briefly talk about it, and then we're gonna move on to a really interesting business up here in the Northern Territory. By the way, we're trying to make sure that when borders open, you'll come here. 
So I'm giving you the Northern Territory examples. So we're pivoting on who. So on the operations perspective, we're talking about what customers, which businesses, remember business to com uh, customer or business to business can be very important to you. What, what products or services, where, are you doing it through deliveries, through pickup, through come to me? No, well, that was a bit harder, but still, some people co-located with other essential services where people did have to go. Um, and I'm going to bring up an example later on of a company that did exactly that. They opened a pop-up straight in front of the supermarkets up here so that their uh, product could actually be found. And or you might move online. And certainly there's been a huge shift into that possibility when. Now, in this uh, interim period during COVID, some people closed their doors with the intent to open them. Others went for shorter hours. Some went 24 by 7 because they went online. And then we've already talked about the why. This is the most, uh, this is the key. If you don't keep track of your why and make your pivoting, your new way of operating the changes you do line up with your unique value proposition and your values as both a person and as a business, then you will actually destroy the possibility of your, the business going forward because people will lose trust in you. So very important, the why. Now the other angle to this, because we've all been told we should go digital, we also then have many different aspects and help that can help you pivot and these are aspects that into the future you'll need to think about so there's social media using it at all using it more expertly using it more pervasively that is for everything uh, what your online presence is going to look like what's your voice uh, your online marketing are you actually going to buy marketing or are you not Online ordering, are you going to make this easy? Oh, it's interesting to see how companies like um, Google, Google My Business, has added on some online deliveries and etc. to it's how you can classify your business. Whereas until just this last week, they really emphasised online, um, in-person business at physical geographical location, a shop front online ordering, online payments. Square is another example. If you've heard of Square, Square is um, adding a way for you to do home deliveries and charge for it. So they're all pivoting. The companies that help us out are pivoting. Then there's the online meeting, which we've all become much more familiar with. Webinars like this one, tutorials. Are you going to do webinar-based tutorials? Are you going to turn your craft business into an online teaching activity? We actually do know of a few up here that have done that. And then of course, there's the more conventional means, the ones we're already used to, like phone, email, messaging, accounting, customer relationship management, doing quotes and all those other things. So what you pivot on is going to be something that you're really going to have to think about. In fact, one of the things that's different now with the digital, um, you've all heard of Scott Morrison. You might not have heard a quote that we've been using here. And that is, have you ever heard of telemedicine? That is being able, uh, having a medical person able to support um, a, a patient over the phone or Zoom and etc. Up here in the Northern Territory, because we are so wide uh, spread geographically, um, they've been actively trying to get telemedicine as something you can claim on Medicare for something like 10 years or more but for a very long time. And when Scott Morrison actually announced that he was going to put um, billions of dollars into this, here's a quote he had, and that was, 10 years of reform in 10 days. And that's what COVID's been. It's caused many of us to move into things we never thought we would. There's interesting ways to see the digital into the future and many, many commentators are saying that digital is here to stay. I'm sure you've heard about people saying, well, why would one work in an office when one can work from home? So let's go on to our first case study. So I promised you an interesting business up here in Darwin. There's 
Here's a, um, an article in a paper magazine, which is also a website up here in Darwin. And if you come to the Territory, you really got to have a look at Off the Leash. Off the Leash tells us all about what's going on, uh, puts in the next month, it has articles and etc. And in Off the, Off the Leash in July 2019, there was this article. It's about the bar in the burbs. And so about 10 minutes out of Darwin Central is a place called Nightcliff, a little not so good looking um, local shopping centre, maybe 500 metres from the water on the next road in. Um, and it was a world away from Nightcliff that Dom, sorry, I can't remember to say his name, concocted the plan for the Top End's newest cocktail bar. So we're talking about a cocktail bar. This cocktail bar is quite cute. It's small. They specialise in things that taste um, hmm, fruity, but also right through to a serious cocktail lover. And they put complimentary, more like finger foods with it. It's a relatively small bar. It's a local bar. Now, that was July 2019. Not so long ago, really. It's only went for it 12 months. Then this happened. Darwin Bar delivering cocktails straight to your door, freshly poured from the back of a, wait for it, ute. And that's exactly what happened. This guy went out on the road and took the cocktail experience to people in their driveways. Um, I think that you could really see that this person is innovative. So if we go into what this man did, um, he took the things which were important to him and put them into something which would keep his business in the eye of his potential customers, the locals. So his deliveries were free to the suburbs immediately around Nightcliff and a small fee if you went further. Now that we're into uh, post-COVID-ish sort of things, you can see now in June 2020, he's actually back to doing things in the bar because here in uh, Darwin, we're up to phase three, I think. And we have indoor as well as outdoor activities happening. So you can see that he's moving back to being indoors as well as having his outside. So I want to just walk through our who, what, where, when and why of this business. So before, anyone over 18 who loves cocktails, entertainment and good company is who with his business. Uh, we've already talked about his what, where we've talked about, when was Friday and Saturday, 4pm to late, Sunday 2 to 10pm and why he's serving the market of a good local venue lots of ingredients of lo that are local and no uh, a neighbourhood feel. And you can see where his digital bent is. Now, in his pivoting, he's actually got a new situation. Same people, 18, like cocktails, but they're stuck at home or in quarantine. And they're looking for entertainment. So he's added on the who. Um, the what, well now you can see exactly what he took out and he did it from the back of his ute. Um, he did home delivery, as I said, free or a little bit um, of, a, uh, of a cost or pick up if you wanted to travel yourself. He actually expanded his hours. He's doing four nights a week, six till nine. And his why is right back in line with what he's always talked about, which is we want you to enjoy yourself. So let me bring your self-isolation some pep. His social media changed a little. He actually didn't so, do so much in the way of social media and he certainly upped his online marketing. He put another article into Off The Leash explaining what he was doing and he added online ordering and online payments. And as we said before, now we're going to look, to the, look ahead. This is the nature of your planning to deal with slow markets. You can't do one thing and say that's it nothing more. You actually have to keep on looking ahead and keep on doing that planning so that you're in a position to adapt as things change. So looking ahead, which is sort of starting here, although we're kind of aware in the back of our minds that it could go back 
we could have to move backwards. So that's a mighty good reason for people to keep and to build their online capacity, their digital supports, their digital excellence, to get good, not just mm, about their online marketing, but really good at it and very good at, at targeting it. So we're back to anyone who's over 18, where our what is back to what it was before, the when is back to where it was before, the where is actually back to where it was before, it's not doing the um, deliveries to people's driveways anymore, uh, but the why is definitely being added to, he's mo more actively talking online about supporting the artists community. So he's bringing in come and learn how to sessions and he's also bringing in come and listen to sessions. You would have seen on that previous slide, I'll just slip back. He's got here um, someone doing um, small artists playing guitar. I did it before, but he's doing it even more. Um, and there's also now, as I said, if you go and look at their social media pages, you'll actually see quite a bit of new activities going on. So I promised that I'd start talking about someone who took, who changed their wear. So this company, Bella, is, um, the owners own three restaurants in a, a very popular tourist area here in Darwin called the Darwin Waterfront. Now it's also a very popular area for um, Darwinians and for people from the suburbs, people coming into town to get to nightclubs and etc. Um, it's not all that far from out um, to in here in Darwin. Uh, so you have to have some variety and some great things at any of the locations. Now in the past, um, at the three restaurants that were owned by this particular company, they didn't have a takeaway option, they only did in-house. And that was because the meals, which are largely pasta-based, you know, once you put the sauce on the pasta, the pasta doesn't travel as well, the pasta keeps on cooking and gets rather, well, not al dente. And so they didn't do takeaway. They were made to be, uh, their meals at all of their restaurants were made to be um, presented as part of the experience at one of the three restaurants that they had at the waterfront. Now when um, the restaurants at the waterfront are also not easy to do pick up from, uh, you kind of have to walk into the central courtyard but through buildings, it's mm, two, three hundred meters maybe to some of the restaurants from where you can park. So it's not so good for pickups. When the restrictions came in, they had to close every one of those three restaurants. They had 15 staff, they had to lay off most of them. Now this doesn't do good for anyone and certainly from a, for a business and those thinking forward, it doesn't really bode well for the future. So the owners started thinking. They noticed that pasta was being panic bought in supermarkets. I don't know if it happened near you, but here there was no pasta in sight, same as there was no toilet paper. It was out of stock everywhere. Um, however, what they realised is they had an in-house capability and they had expertise and that in-house capability was making fresh pasta and they had people who could do it. They could also make fresh sauces. So they pivoted. What they did is they started making pre-made meals consisting of pasta and sauce. Bought together but not placed in together. Then later on, they found that people were quite interested in their arachini, arachini balls and so they made them and froze them and they added those to the round. Now, they, off, they added then an online shop capacity uh, from their website that you could order and pay online and then they started going, well, we've got this capability, let's build it up. So they offered, they went out to the broader network, they went to, um, clubs and associations and said, hey, um, we can, uh, if you, you know, want to plan ahead for some of your events, you know, why don't you um, have pasta we could deliver. So they actually started doing pre-orders for events when things opened up a bit. They also um, went to um, 
support those associations for their virtual lunch meetings. So when people had a lunch meeting, everybody did it by Zoom. What people started doing was um, all eating the same meal, but in their own home. So Bella delivered the pasta to them for the virtual meetings. Then the other thing they did is they started going out to the independent local grocers and then later on to um, Woolworths and etc. But first to local IGAs and gourmet supermarkets and got them to stock their fresh pasta and sauce in store. So now the distribution network was growing. They were actually accepted by pretty well all the grocers they approached. Well, wow. local ingredients, local supply. Up here in Darwin, we got quite a few supply chains closed very abruptly with COVID and that included things like pasta. So then what they did is they went to shopping centres and of course shopping centres had had a lot of shops stop shut. So what they did is they went into the pop-up stores. Um, so right next to where I live, or very close to where I live, is the Darwin uh, Centre and there's a sh um, shopping centre called the Mitchell Centre. Mitchell Centre has a Coles in it. Um, I'm pretty sure you are aware of how many bread shops have closed of late. It was actually pre-COVID, but still, that bread shop straight outside Woolworths, sorry, Coles in this instance, straight outside Coles, became their pop-up shop. And so you can right now buy fresh pasta from those stores. And of course, you have to go there if you're going to get your groceries. All in all, they were able to hold on to nearly half their staff through the COVID period through selling pasta, producing pasta and selling pasta, producing sauce and selling sauce where, where they started from was only selling it in a restaurant as an eat-in experience. So looking ahead, their restaurants are open now. So we're back to aware being restaurants open, but they've kept their pasta business going. So their where is now also local supermarkets and supermarket chains. Uh, and shopping centres and they're also expanding into their fresh pasta going into other local restaurants along with their source ingredients. Now if you'd like to find out more about Bella and watch their story their um, address online is bellafreshpasta.com.au. So let's change the tack now. Let's go on to an online business or a business that was always intending to be online. So this one is called Hyra. The first time I saw this, I thought it said Hydra, um, you know, as in the mythical beast with many heads. But then I worked out that actually it says Hyra. And it was in existence before COVID. Only just though, only just in existence. COVID came along and kind of well, messed with their forward planning. So Hydra is a, a new app. It's made by a local duo in Darwin. Um, the app is all about renting out your spare belongings, such as your lawnmower, your tools, or even formal dresses. Um, and it's about renting to people in your local area. So you can hear the who. When COVID happened, all of a sudden there was, it went from sort of growing business uh, in the local communities, um, growing interest in their app to zero, zip, nothing. Well, well, that was pretty understandable, wasn't it? Because people don't, didn't want to use other people's belongings, too much disinfection needed. And anyway, does disinfectant work on COVID? Mm, who's to know? So it just went away. Now, and in addition, people didn't want to go to other people's homes. They weren't even allowed to, in a way, go to other people's homes um, to pick up stuff to use it. So there went the before scenario. So they then started pivoting. They saw a gap and that was helping people to know what local food delivery was available. So we've got the local thing going and they started thinking food delivery. Could we make it so that people could um, find out which restaurants were open easily and see what they had online and actually purchase through Hira. They added that section. Um, they just 
added the section because they didn't actually have enough money to rebuild the whole website and change its look and feel and change the app's look and feel. So they just added a section. And then they advertised on Facebook um, to get people to the app. Now, unfortunately for them, just as they were about to do a full launch, another organisation, which was also on something similar, launched. So oh, there went disaster too. Um, and for their business plan, and in fact, that other business called Deliverish, which we'll, we'll see, I've got a link to an article about them as well later on. Um, they actually, Deliverish got some uh, high profile coverage on TV, don't know how, but they did, and which meant that all of a sudden Hira wasn't in that space either. So rather than trying to compete directly with a big, already prominent company, what they did was they changed their model. Um, now they only specialise, the, they only advertise the daily specials of restaurants around Diamond on their app. And by selling on their app, um, and then also themselves doing highly targeted advertising on Facebook, they've actually made it so that those businesses that put their specials on Hira have been selling more plates. So they're helping, they've now got a new model, which is business to business, rather than business to customer. That's really sound. Uh, a pivot that really helped them keep on going. Now what they're doing, as we move into um, the future, what they're doing is building on that model. That one there, working through businesses rather than working with individuals. And they're also going to be hiring out a new thing, and that is unsold business inventory. So if you've got um, an organisation that has lawnmowers um, and they're not selling, and they now find that they can't sell them, well, wait for it, they can actually use Hira to rent them out. So now we've got a collaboration between businesses, as we were talking about earlier there is a model that can change your situation and be valuable to both them and you to build your business in a slow market. So Hira now has both a basic service for private renters. It doesn't cost you much to rent out your uh, own lawnmower, but they've also got a premium service for businesses, helps business hire out their unused inventory. I really liked the way Hira also displays their work. So it's got the jigsaw puzzle piece for how Hira works, a cup for online ordering, specials advertised, and Hira for business, well, um, hiring out your unsold inventory. And you've got the URL there. So let's move on now to a different scenario. The scenario here is what's happening in a world where technology is becoming the substitute for the face-to-face. -face. Just like you're not attending a lecture theatre and listening to me, you're actually on a Zoom webinar. There are many other places where you can use technology to help people connect and yet not use up their travel time or yours. And on top of that, you can actually have people move more into the online, which we keep being told the millennials are more prepared to do. And actually, so are the rest of us post-COVID. So, with no further introduction, let me move on to the sector, which is real estate. Now, real estate really got hit. And look, we don't know what's going to happen into the future. But if you just think about the mechanics of it, Purchasing, selling, managing property, managing building projects, all of those things are impacted by social distancing or physical distancing. Um, also, most of us, when we think about things, aren't necessarily confined to what's local. Personally, I'm into investment, but the places I'd like to invest are for the Western Australians down south of Perth, heading towards one of those lovely wine regions that you've got. Or if you're up in Queensland, I don't mind the idea of being slightly north of Brisbane. Don't want to go up to Mackay, but I do want to be somewhere like that. I'm thinking those are the areas where I would, if I was investing in property, that's where I would be. 
So let's have a think about it. COVID has, remember I talked about Scott Morrison and his 10 years of reform in 10 days? Well, also what we have is many years of resistance to doing things other than face-to-face, -face, totally blown away. Because if you don't do it a different way, it doesn't happen at all. And now we're kind of getting used to it. So in uh, property and real estate, that might be the virtual um, tours. Might not be a substitute for actually being there, but it is a better representation if it's done well. Uh, we'll put that caveat on it. If it's done well, that is a way to screen out the places you would go to or not go to. And certainly for the real estate agent and the property manager, it means that they may get less people who are kicking the tires, if you know that expression, less people who are just coming to look and more people, people who are serious about having a look. So it could help you pre-qualify your leads if you are a real estate agent or a property manager. The other thing is the digital auction. Now, again, um, in-person auctions with that um, very entertaining view of an auctioneer, I have no idea how, how many they speak that fast, let alone actually anybody understand what they're saying. However, that thing is no longer a doable. People are actually not even sure they want to do it and people are a bit wary about traveling. So the digital auction sounds like a pretty good idea. In fact, there's um, a chap by the name of John, who is the director of Busy Agent um, down in New South Wales. And he says, the theater of an on-site auction has gone, but I feel like the result is the same. And that's what we have to focus on. What is it about? What are people trying to get? So then the other is the virtual contract. We're kind of heading that way in many, many industries. Um, property is probably one of the laggers. It's been a little bit harder to get people to take a virtual signing arrangement, but there are many mechanisms for that now. So digital supports are right on the money. And in fact, in Australia, we have over 260 companies that are working in the um, digital tools to support property anywhere in the life cycle from um, uh, building through to buying. Now that's a pretty big industry. Certainly worth thinking about it as a way to change the paradigm or to pivot your business in this sector. So I'm just going to take a sip of water. Jack, have we had any questions we need to answer? Uh, no, not for what I can see. Okay, so keep in mind we are going to have a QA. and a thanks Jack, by the way, a little bit in a little while. So if you've got any questions, please get ready with them. You can type them in early if you like. So let's go on to the next business. This one is in, in an area which you probably can tell from the gym clothes is one that really got badly hit anything that had people in close proximity sweating called personal training, health, well-being, nutrition, massage, any of those. This company here is called Wellness for Life. Um, the owner, Sarah O'Connor, whom you can see up in the top left, uh, is somebody who came to um, working in this business in 2013. She's got a strong technical background as in um, university qualifications and etc. And what she's really been focusing on since 2013 is totally individualized, totally personalized and wait for it, she started online. Now that was back in 2013. Over the years, her business has changed somewhat. And when she moved to Darwin back in about 2017, she actually decided that she would move more into the gym. She's got, as you can see up the middle there, they're at Edge Gym up here in a shopping center called Casuarina. Um, and this year, that particular ad you're looking at is the three people in her team, Sarah's in the middle, and they're looking at transformation challenges, which start from nutrition and go through to um, boot camps and to training plans and individualized nutrition and training for your goals. Well, come COVID, they were six weeks into an eight week face-to-face -face transformational challenge. 
in the next three weeks, things totally changed because the gym door was shut. So in a week, their pivot was, well, let's keep on doing face-to-face, -face, but do it outdoors. 10 days later-ish, can't do it outdoors either. So what they did is move very fast into doing online boot camps, into doing um, uh, upping the ante on their um, Facebook messenger group, um, their support groups, starting to do online instruction and tutorial, moving to Zoom meetings for individual coaching for, to keep people going and motivated. So by the time they'd finished, they went from in that last two weeks, they actually only lost about 5% um, to 10% of their clients from that face-to-face -face challenge. Now, of course, what they did is start looking down the barrel at what next. So as you can see to the bottom right, what they did is move to an online challenge. And now the, in that online, sh online challenge, which actually just finished on Sunday, a good quarter of the people in that challenge are actually people not in Darwin. But the whole thing started online and it's moving now, um, as I said, through to the conclusion. They're actually able to have a concluding breakfast for those in Darwin sitting at one of the local restaurants. However, what happened during that period of time was that the owner, Sarah O'Connor, started looking at how do I future proof my business? And the answer is go back online. But don't go back online with everything. Build on what you've already learnt and focus it. In fact, in the last couple of weeks, she's been working on her export plan. Watch out Canada and America and maybe even China. This business is going to move into somewhere else. So, I'm on to the very last example I'm going to give before we do some Q&A. So if you've got some questions, please feel free to start typing them. So um, up here in Darwin and in the Northern Territory, so we're going to expand out to Alice Springs, um, a very interesting regional area, which while we're up here doing our 32 degrees, they had a night of one degree just three days ago, I was talking to someone. So quite a different place, even though it's part of the Northern Territory. So there's an article that I'm quite happy to get send you or give you links to, which is called How These Brilliant Biz Businesses Stayed Afloat During Lockdown. Let's read that the other way. How these businesses survived and got sales during a slow market. Same thing. In fact, I'd like to talk about the company up on the top left. It's called the Buy Alice Collective. And the name um, of the owner of the person who did this is Kim Hopper. And Kim knew that COVID was going to have a huge impact on her business. So she began, before everything closed down, to set up a local grocery network. So when um, people really came to grips with what was changing, um, I was personally in, in Catherine, when, uh, which is about four hours south of Darwin, when things started to close down. And down there in Catherine, they hadn't really kind of worked out there was anything happening on the first day we were there. On the third day we were there, there were actually blanks on the shelves in the Woolworths. So, huge change very quickly. Kim Hopper really had her forward thinking head on. Very adaptive. Hopper and her partner ran run a company called Do You Coffee Roasters and they're a cafe and a wholesaler in Alice Springs. What they did is they brought together a number of other businesses and they created um, a company or a group called Buy Alice Collective. So four locally owned businesses that teamed up to deliver boxes of premium coffee, baked goods and fresh produce around the uh, community. So during the very height of the impact, they were delivering 80 boxes of premium groceries a week. So you can tell they knew who they were selling to. They also, and that was in keeping with what they normally did. They also knew that people were going to need it to kind of come to them. So they changed the where. Um, and what they added into their why is something that was about community growth and development. They saw this, and I'm quoting um, 
Kim when she says it was an opportunity to brighten people's days and share and that that's what she was about. But then on top of that, that why helped her with the marketing story. They sh she was sharing her brand with a whole new audience, people who'd never walked into the store, the, the shop front before. So in fact, post or rather as we move on to the what might be new normal depending on what happens across the west of Australia, rest of australia and the world a lot of people says kim are a bit upset that we're winding it back now people have really enjoyed slowing down so having their stuff home delivered really appealed and this is the best of what the alice has to offer in fact, she has a, a commentary which I think is great for all of us here, and that is, there are a lot of opportunities if you're willing to give something a go. So, for the moment, I've come to the end of my examples, and we're going to hand it over to you. So, if you've got any questions, now's the time to add them. We haven't had any questions or oh, we've had a comment. Awesome presentation and stories of business. Thanks, Christine. Oh, thank you very much for that feedback. I appreciate it. It's certainly been very interesting to research this topic. Um, I've spent quite a few hours, um, a lot more than I had intended, um, because of the fact that there are such, like I've just gone flipped back to this, um, the, just the previous page. As it says, no one factors a pandemic into their business plan, but there's been some mighty innovative people across the top end. Um, in particular, I'm sure they've been uh, in all parts of Australia. They're actually doing things in a different way. I think that that is a very powerful thing for us to remember into the future. So it's not about just planning. As we said before, it's about being the adaptive business. We need to actually plan, sure. But what we need to do is to recognise something's unusual and start thinking ahead, plan what we're going to do and break it into steps and wait for it, do it. We need to think about what we're going to pivot on too. So I think uh, the reason I went for who, what, where, when and why is because we kind of need something, we get something simpler, something shorter to help us guide our thoughts to build on top of our more serious business planning activity. We really need to be thinking ahead and in fact our key is we need to think outside the square and adapt. So I'm unsure if you just answered this question, but how does one develop the mindset to pivot and find opportunities during adversity? Okay, I think you've hit on an extremely interesting thought. <laughs> during adversity is actually the hardest time to do any pivoting. The reason for that is our brains are full. They're full of perhaps shock, perhaps grief, perhaps oh my crumb, where's the next piece of um, anything coming from? And uh, uh, everybody's throwing stuff at me and saying, I ought to do this and I ought to do that. Right there is where we need to stop. So how do we do the pivot in, in the, the face of adversity? The first thing we do is look after ourselves. I know that sounds a little selfish, but I would like to give you some wisdom from my darling partner of many years. And that he says, he says to me, Christine, Christine, just think if you're not okay, we're not okay. And I'm going to say to you the same thing for your business. Number one, how you pivot, look out for yourself. Another friend of mine came up with another um, uh, uh, commentary to me. She said, be gentle with yourself. Christine, that's what I'm trying to do. Be gentle with myself. And I do think that's the next thing to do. Haven't gone on to the next thing to do yet, have I? Now, the next thing is, as we said before, the very first thing to do is in the good times, we really need to plan. Seriously. So I'm going to come back to this one. We need to plan 
space and then we need to be in a, a, an adaptive mindset which happens after we have planned we need to do all the normal things we talked about then the next this is our preparation we need to be monitoring but not scared um, if you're in a I was listening to a TED talk recently and a lady was talking about being in the emergency department of a hospital and she said stress is not a bad thing except that if stress is that thing that closes down your mind versus being ready and then ready to act so number one normal business planning number two make sure you actually think through the future monitor what's happening and then adapt i think the other thing to do is to be talking and to be supporting yourself whereas people who actually have an entrepreneurial and forward thinking and possibilities mind so i'm really talking about the framework for how you seed and how you think outside the square last but not least i think you need some sort of very simple framework which is basically what our pivot here is about is for you to do the thinking so adopt a way of thinking that suits you and think the who what where when and keep in mind the why of your business before you actually act i hope that that gives you an answer that at least gives you a framework and certainly i think you can um, make sure you find a network of people who have a similar mind to you So if we don't have any further questions, we're okay, are we Jack? No more further questions? No, we should be good. Excellent. So let me thank you for attending. I um, appreciate the feedback I got a little earlier. I also hope that you actually found something that you can take away from this. And that's what I'd do now right now if I was you is what's your takeaway? What are you going to act on? Um, and I hope that, and I wish you luck, as well as endeavour in finding opportunities in a slower market as we move forward.